Thank you, Mark. Definitely very interesting. I came away convinced that this is actually now the time for AR and VR. I was one of those nerdy hopefuls in 95, like, oh, this will be real, and then was disappointed repeatedly since then. So, so that was good. And then I like the point that, you know, as with any new technology, you can't make it about the technology searching for a problem to solve. You actually have to already think in terms of the user need and actually develop for that user need. And, and I, I think those, those are brilliant takeaways. Um, so I'd like to bring up our panelists. So basically, Jennifer, David, Mark, and Scott to the stage. Um, we'll basically, come on up, guys. Yep, please, please, come, come join us here. As this says, this will be a very interactive session, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do a bunch of questions up front and then you know only hand it to you guys at the end. Uh, we should have roving microphones. We have microphones. Yes, I see people, and and so have at it. Do you have do you have questions for these guys uh, while we have them? And um, just show of hands. Oh, there we go. Hey, good evening. There was a lot of case of uh, augmented uh, visual visual aspect of uh, reality. How about the other senses? Can we augment the smell, the taste? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Too. Mark, do you want to kick that one off? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's fine. Great. Well, um, so definitely, I think we already saw a great example of augmented audio experience from what Amber's mm -hmm. doing. Um, of course, it's more technically difficult to do smell and, and, and sense, but there is work being done in that area. There's um, uh, a researcher called Adrian Cheok, who's at the City University of London, who has been developing um, artificial um, taste, actually. So you can put a small uh, piece of um, circuitry into your mouth, and it will generate uh, tastes on your tongue. He's also been looking at, he developed an app that lets you deliver um, smell remotely using uh, small perfume uh, sachets that you plug into your iPhone. Um, but I would say that the, the visuals are probably, uh, well, where taste and, and smell and um, is, is probably 20 years behind what's happening with visual now. But I'm really excited about the audio experiences because you've, you can see with the augmented reality, especially displays, you know, the Google Glass or other displays, they have a quite small visual field of view. So maybe 30 degrees or even less. But if you've got headphones in, you have a surround uh, sound. So you can have a 360 uh, audio experience. So some of the research we're doing in our lab is how you can use really rich audio experiences to compensate for a small visual experience. So you know, mm. if, if you want to uh, be aware of something over here, you can play a sound that appears to come from over here and then draws your attention to there, and then you see the visuals as a result. So I think that's a really exciting area to work in. And then the taste and, and the smell and the touch will come in the next coming decades as well. Just to add to that as well, um, at our last meetup, we had Roger Lawrence, Chief Technologist and uh, Head of Innovation at Hewlett Packard, uh, who talked about the telephone being more or less the first you know, augmented experience on a mass scale. And I, I, and I actually had a question about that, and maybe I'll, I'll give it to you, Scott, which is, so the iPhone definitely, I, I, I think even four or five years ago, I can remember, you know, Yelp was kind of doing augmented reality, showing you where restaurants were. And so I thought it would be, a, a kind of easy platform and we'd see like a plethora of augmented reality apps. And I haven't really noticed that, or I certainly haven't noticed any any like big name augmented reality apps. The, 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 uh, any reason for this or, you know, any, any am I just missing out on, on some apps? Just what are your thoughts? And yeah, maybe Scott and then David. Yeah. yeah, there were plenty of toes in the water and initially augmented reality was about this point of interest experience as the iPhone allowed access to its camera. Uh, but my hypothesis is that uh, augmented reality will cross that chasm when it becomes human-to-human -human communication, and a lot of other use cases for, for mass consumers will follow. Um, but definitely, as we can already see here with a few people holding their phones up uh, towards the stage, it's a natural gesture uh, from Snapchat to Instagram and so on. It's a natural gesture to hold up your phone. Uh, so that's not stopping it. But uh, definitely, I, I think it's the human-to-human -human communication which will drive and a lot of other things will come through after it. Um, I'll give Dave his, uh, some yeah, sure. time on that as well. Um, so that, that form of augmented reality that Yelp used was called geolocational augmented reality. Um, and it was using the GPS and accelerometer and gyro and all this sort of thing. So that kind of became readily available and everyone jumped on board that. But then to go into really what is 
computer vision based augmented reality, the camera needs to understand what it's looking at. And right now that is most robustly done through print. But um, as uh, Mark said, there are devices coming next year that basically have connects built in, like the one Mark showed, the Project Tango. Uh, and when the device can understand space and understand the shape that is in front of it, then we can augment to anything in real time uh, to scale. And that is really, that's where augmented reality, to, to my mind, really starts to take off. Uh, there's just been that gap in between, and a lot of misunderstanding as well, that pointing at a page and going straight to a website is augmented reality. There's just been so much misinformation. Other questions, uh, right? One, yeah. Yep. Yeah, uh, Arya Sermer from DWA. Just um, thinking about governance and about, you know, the future's bright and this can be really awesome and amazing, but at what point in time do we need to put governance in place and where should that come from? You've got movies like Dreamscape, more recently The Matrix, people plugging in and not plugging out. Who should be responsible for that and how should we do that? Jennifer, do you want to? <laughs> yeah, I, look, I actually think we've missed the boat on things like social media, where we've actually, we got... Grab the mic, maybe, yeah. Um, we got things like social media, to me, the regulation on social media is still not caught up with where we are now. And they've got no idea what they're doing. And the, the, the regulators are kind of looking at 1990 and going, how does that fit in 2015 or 16 or 20? Um, and consumers are going to come up with new things to do with it. And people are going to come up with new platforms. And I think the question is, when should they do it? They should have done it 20 years ago when it first came up. But they had no idea of where it was going to go. And we're always behind with the regulation. And the, I can remember one of the first things I saw on AR, and probably at that first presentation you saw, it was one of these classic ones of you hold up your phone and it augments the world around you and it starts to tell you things about, you know, and then I can remember the picture, it's of a family walking towards you and you hold up the camera in front of it and there's a little thing underneath the guy that says no and pedophile. And you go, where does privacy sit in this? Mm -hmm. But then where does privacy sit in what, what's happening with so much else? And I think it's one of the reasons why AR, some of the early AR apps were kind of like they were fun and quirky and they were used for utility, but you know, once you'd use them once, you didn't really have a reason to do it again. And then you had the issues over privacy. So I, when are we going to get it right? We're not going to get it right. We're just going to keep on fumbling and tripping over ourselves and get it wrong the whole time mm -hmm. and complain. Um, and that's, I think, the reality of, of everything that's happening in digital because it moves so fast. I mean, look at everything in media these days. So. Mm. Good point. Right here. Yeah, just a question. Uh, so do you agree that we are creating a new user experience rather than an existing one. I mean, the panel on Magic Leap a few months ago, they were talking how hard it was to try to educate people to interact with the world in a completely new way, and even train developers to start to use their brains in a completely different new way to create content for this world. So do you agree that the challenges or the friction of the technology is that maybe people are not used to get that much information in that specific uh, context. Maybe throw that to Mark first and then over to Scott. Oh, that's a great question. So um, I think the dream is that we should be able to interact with our digital content as easily as we can interact with the real world around us. But we're still a ways getting uh, to that point. And so some of the friction you're seeing is because the developers, either the, con the technology isn't able to provide that experience or the developers don't um, know how to use or to build the interaction metaphors for that. So for example, in our work, in our lab, we're doing some work now with uh, speech and gesture interaction, which turns out is very, very natural. You know, to, we have to reach out and grab something and give a speech command at the same time. But very, very few uh, developers in the AR VR space have done that uh, before because they're coming from oftentimes a, a game experience. Um, some of you may have, you know, if you've got developers that are building for uh, iPad experiences, then pinch to zoom is very, very common. But of course, when you provide an AR experience to somebody, they can't pinch to zoom anymore. So people have this. Uh, metaphors they're familiar with and they try and use them in AR and they don't work as well. So there's going to be this transition period where people um, try and, um, you know, before they can adopt new metaphors, they've got to learn how to use them. And the developers have to learn how to um, also convey those to people as well. I think too, and it's the reason why I, that Marshall McLuhan quote, something I've probably been using for 15 years. I, I think, you think about it, okay, so we had radio, we listened. We had cinema, we sat in a darkened room and we had something presented to us. We got television, we sat in a room with other people and had a social environment looking at TV. We got the internet and then suddenly we could interact with it and make it go different places. We got the mobile and suddenly it could do different things because it had location and it had a camera and it, it could let us see through and it, and it could provide context to the world and it had that sound and it was quite personal. I think every time you look at a new level of interaction, you start to look at a new way of seeing the world and I really see 
AR and VR as that next stage, but I completely agree with Mark. As long as you've got an AR experience where you have to tap a little screen and move something, it's just an enhanced mobile experience. When you've got an experience where you move your head and things move and you move your hands and gesture in 3D space, that is when we'll get to that point. And if you think about it, I mean, I can remember everybody talking about the mobile web when mobiles came out and then apps have taken over here. Mm -hmm. And I think that we'll see, we'll see AR and VR come into their own when they have the same sort of interface that becomes natural. Computers and web became natural with a mouse. Mobile became natural with touch screens. I think we'll see those become natural when we move to gestures. And yeah. it is a new world. And maybe as David grabs the phone, and now building off of that, or grabs the microphone, um, y you know, a lot of you guys spoke about how legacy, you know, every new technology, we tend to use it in the legacy way, just as Jennifer is referring. Do you, do you have an opinion on maybe how we can accelerate that path to, to getting over legacy and, and finding the ways to truly use AR and VR? Um, uh, it's actually just a matter of watching, uh, I, because it's a matter of watching people interact with AR and I just watch every, like people for the first time interact with it. I've seen um, uh, creative directors of major agencies accidentally put their finger over the um, lens and then it, it's gone black. You, you take it, you activate it. No, 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 you put your finger over the lens, it's all right, you know. Yeah. And just to see that fear, to see what people instinctively do and how they move and it really is almost like, un under, it's a dance mm -hmm. that they do with, with, in the augmented space really with, with the device and, and then it's completely different when they have like a heads up display and they're doing it that way. Um, it was just a, an, an interesting point about the, the shift in um, creative thinking the other day when I, we were actually doing an exercise where we took an um, After Effects video, we split it out into layers in augmented space and I was having an argument with the editor where um, he was like, oh no, what we'll do here, we'll just hide it behind and I'm like, there is no hiding because you can go around and have a look. He's like, what? And he's like, oh, I, I can't hide anything. I'm like, exactly, <laughs> it's just everything's laid bare which is also the beauty of the user experience as well. If you communicate in that space, it feels like there's nothing to hide. It feels like the user's in control and therefore I believe it elicits trust quicker. Actually, uh, this question kind of overlaps the earlier one about why didn't the Yelp AR experience take off, I think. Yeah, and and uh, I think largely the, the marketeers and others, business owners, uh, started to see like they, they've lost control. The, the, the mobile uh, owner actually now gets to decide what angle you view the home, mm. um, you know, what kind of time you spend on a certain colour or whatever else. I, I think another problem has been that um, there hasn't been a, a wider proliferation of uh, an ease of augmented uh, authoring tools. And now Mark's just highlighted a couple drag and drop type of authoring tools which will definitely help uh, a greater production level of augmented reality. It's got to be so simple that almost everyone can do it like uploading a, a YouTube clip. But there's one other thing and that is Minecraft. And it was very clever that a certain company bought Minecraft. With 30 million kids creating in 3D, it'll, it'll be within their DNA mm. to think in this space. And uh, it's going to be a great wave coming through into the corporate world when they uh, enter the corporate world and design for us in 3D. They will get it straight away. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we learn. <laughs> Other questions? Oh, there's one over here. Um, this stuff's so exciting and uh, with VR and AR it depends in a lot of its uh, kind of applications on good internet. Uh, when we, Netflix came in it kind of, I don't know, my internet got slower. Uh, do you uh -huh. think Australia is ready uh, in terms of bandwidth and data and, and everything with uh, VR and AR and the applications that are about to hit over the next few years? Sort of no. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, maybe the last events of the last week, talking about being agile and innovation, innovative and so on from our, our new leader is, is encouraging, but um, I think at the moment we're ranked about 39th uh, in the world for broadband speeds and uh, by the time our infrastructure is finished we might be around about 100th, um, unless things change quickly somehow. Um, we've got work to do. There's no doubt we've got the talent and you're sitting there in a company which has talent. Uh, but yes, uh, we need a, a, a great infrastructure helping this talent come to light. Of course, 
uh, we still have ability to scale around the world with our AR, VR production. Just to add something to that is the thing you've got to think of is the proliferation of Internet of Things devices we get means that you know, we went from having maybe three devices in our homes to having maybe 30. We're going to go to having three or 400 connected devices. We need IPv6. We need, we need not just cloud computing but fog computing. We need to completely rethink about how, how one device talks to another device and whether we really need the cloud for it and where that sits into it. So I think the problem we've got is massive in scale and that, and that you know, the, the NBN is probably only going to be 20 years too late. So. I just have one thing to add too. Um, so first of all, you can have a VR and AR experience on a standalone device without connecting to the internet. Secondly, um, you know, if you want to watch a movie, maybe that's going to be two or four gigabytes for a you know, one-hour movie or so. Um, you can, uh, because the device you've got in your hand is generating all the content, the um, size of what you need to send to the device is much, much less. You know, if I wanted to have an AR or VR experience on a mobile phone, I might need to send a one megabyte um, 3D model, and then I can use that for the next hour or so, and it's one megabyte, not you know, two gigabytes or, or four gigabytes. So um, I think you'll, y what will happen, is, as, as Jenny was saying, is that you'll have more devices connected to the network, but the amount of traffic per device may go down if they're doing AR and VR compared to just straight media uh, streaming. But it still doesn't solve the problem of Australia's slow network, of course. There's also um, the fact that we use Unity at the moment primarily as our as um, uh, the way that we create experiences and there's plugins um, for Euphoria and all that sort of thing. Um, Unity was never built for augmented reality, and it's not necessarily the the most economical way to get these experiences into your device. So there's things like the augmented web. There are protocols that are you know um, already there that you know when that when that comes around when there are ways uh, technologies to stream into our devices um, uh, more economically the, we're very close to that one of the big things is Apple is stopping us from having access to the camera um, through the web browser but hopefully they'll, they'll lift that there's, there's uh, w3.org I think is that mark isn't it mark the augmented web um, standards organization but um, yeah th that'll be a whole new space as well augmented web all right we have time for one more question then uh, back. Jennifer, to your point earlier about gestures and, and probably to the, to the whole panel, um, how do you see the industry overcoming the challenge or the risk of having too many different gesture languages given so many different platforms and so many different companies playing in the, in the area? I, I think that in some ways I think the way we might answer that is by making the gestures relevant to exactly what it is you're doing. And it's kind of one of those ones where, where if, you think about, if you think about really good computer human interface design, then you know that you've got the, I think it's, it's Fitz law, where you can throw the mouse up the top and you should be able to get an experience because there's a boundary at the top of the screen and therefore it should know that it's hit that boundary. Uh, and, and very few people adhere to Fitz law, but it's a great way of actually thinking about doing it but not everybody puts their login button at the same place. And I think we'll get the same thing where it may be that, that pinch to zoom for one application may be simply spreading my hands. For another one, it might be a single hand gesture. And I think that's when we'll get confusion and take some time to actually learn how to do that. Two button mice, three button mice, those sorts of things. But I think that it, it's going to be a, a case of playing what, gesture, what gestures should be is about interacting with the objects that you're looking at. And therefore, if the object is in front of you, the manipulation of that object should be natural. So I don't think we should be teaching people a gesture language like we should, might teach people sign language, although we may end up with some form of, of single-handed sign language so we can actually spell things out in this environment. So that in, instead of having a virtual typewriter, we're, just, we're making single-handed gestures to actually make letters. And that would be interesting then if we add that, because suddenly we're typing words to people without actually having a different interface. Oh, and just to follow up with that, um, so one important thing to remember is that gestures aren't universal across uh, different human cultures. So for example, in Australia, if I want you to come to me, I'll go like this. In Asia, it's like this. So you know, what we're doing in our research is we're trying to let people define their own gesture language. And as m devices move onto the body, especially with wearable computing, it should be about um, customising the device to the way that you want to interact with it, rather than having generic. And, and you're starting to see that to a certain extent with, with um, some mobile devices, you know, I bet in this room there's probably half a dozen, dozen different um, uh, type um, swipe uh, keyboard input options on your device uh, that you might have you know, with Android or iPhone. And you can customise that depending on how you look. So it'll be the same with AR and, and VR. Once you start having head mount displays with gesture interaction, it'll be the user themselves that will determine the gestures. Um, and, and many of them will be relevant to the applications that um, you're doing as, as what just Jenny said. 
David and Scott, any last words on, on that or anything else? Um, Scott? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a demo on the um, ODGIware that I have here. Um, I think you tried it out um, before. Did you yeah, hold, yeah. hold up? Yeah, it's a little bit cumbersome um, still, but I think that the yeah, I, I think I more or less failed at the demo. It kept like <laughs> flashing red at me. Yeah, but I think that um, uh, there's a really interesting guy, Eric Lundström um, from Sweden, who has a company called Penny. And um, he developed, um, he actually had an incredible brain injury and um, he met a woman who was a, um, a Swedish Olympian and had become a quadriplegic. And he developed uh, an interface for her where it would sit on her um, lower mandible on a jaw and she could just clench her teeth in order to click it. And then he developed heads up display eyewear and that's by where she moves her head and by clenching, well, I mean, by moving her eyes, sorry, she's pretty... Um, uh, yeah, then she could actually just click and had a, a world of sort of interfaces and now she runs four multi-million dollar companies and is, uh, and, and yeah, he's, he's an amazing guy. But I think it'll just be something that, yeah, we, we will organically find these interfaces and what suits us best. It might be, you might prefer clenching your teeth, you might prefer waving your hand like that. I think we're, you know, as if we can keep it open and allow people to calibrate their own interface, I think that's where it's really going to take off. Yeah, if um, we just forgive a little bit of uh, legacy innovation, uh, without looking at the person next to you, with your left or right hand, if Monday was a button, point at it, click on that button, without looking at the person next to you. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you get the idea. Hands up who went left to right, hands up who went right to left. Hands up who went top to bottom, bottom to top, who went around in a circle. <laughs> Give that man a prize. What that means. Who went through a tunnel. I love it. The tunnel is great. Monday is perhaps most important and every other further day is less important, it's further away. So uh, I think that shows. Um, from the Western to the Eastern culture, the differences we have, and just uh, what the, the panel here have been saying. Um, so I think that's my little input to, to end things here. Brilliant. Well, with that, uh, I, I want to thank the panelists and the audience for uh, you know this, this part of the event. We have, I think, some gifts for the, the participants that, that my team um, will bring over. And, I'll actually just hand it over, as they're handing out the gifts, I'll hand it over to Scott to just do uh, the close. So thank you, everybody. Fantastic.